Chris Lee with Southeastern 14, presented by Bearded Iris here to preview Missouri and Texas a and Our friend Roy Whetstone, straight from the campus of the University of Missouri, joins us, where she's watched a ton of baseball this year. And let's, before we go into the series with the Aggies this weekend, let's rewind last weekend. I keep saying this, every time I watch Missouri play, that looks like a really good ball team to me. Now, we'll see if, if they can bank enough wins to, to get there by season's end, but I watched most of that series with Vanderbilt, and Missouri was right there until about the what the seventh inning of of Game Three. And I mean, that's yeah, Vanderbilt. You could make an argument's the top team in the country. I thought Missouri competing that way. Now I get Missouri's a little different at home. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But I, I thought it, between that, watching a lot of the Big Twelve series, every time I watch this team, I'm just impressed with it. And I totally agree. I think that they're a great team to watch, especially in midweek games. They're actually one of the only teams in Division One baseball that hasn't lost a midweek matchup so far. They just beat Missouri State 10-1 to earlier this week. And especially with the Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt series, it really felt like they should have taken two out of the three games. Honestly, maybe even all three, except it did get away from them in the seventh inning. But, I mean, that first game, they had a huge rally in the eighth inning. Ty Wilmsmeyer, a three-run home run. Place was energized, really felt like they had a great chance to come back. And then, I mean, Dylan Leach just made a just bad idea, had a double, would have been in scoring position with two outs. You just need a base hit at that point to tie up the game. But he tried to stretch it out to three and was thrown out. I mean, very easily thrown out. So that was a bit of a bummer there because it really felt like they would have had a chance to come back, especially in the second game. They did win that game. They walked it off. So that was great for them to get at least one win because I felt like that proved a lot for them, especially because they had dropped their last six in the conference. And to even take a win against Vanderbilt is huge because of how good Vanderbilt is. So I'm excited heading into this weekend against Texas A&M because I feel like they really do have a chance to win that series. Where's Missouri health-wise? It seems like every staff in the league has got three or four arms banged up. I know Missouri has been no exception. Yeah, that's another thing that they're struggling with is they're losing some arms. They've got Maltrude coming in and starting games, which normally you tend to see him come in and relief. That's more of his strong suit there. But Chandler Murphy's back. That's been better. He did give up four uh, runs against Vanderbilt in the final game of that series but I mean it wasn't until the seventh inning he was late he's just coming back and your arms tired and whatnot and um, that's been a struggle but otherwise their pitching seemed to be better than it was against Kentucky and South Carolina so that was a positive to take away from Vanderbilt but also they're getting Cam Chick back in their lineup offensive wise which is good because that'll fill the two spot because that was a big thing Beiser talked about was I mean, Juju Stevens had taken over in that position, but he wasn't not necessarily confident in in him because he was producing hits every now and then, but it wasn't consistent. And you could definitely tell that they were missing Lovich and Cam Chick, but now that Cam Chick's back, he's slotting back in there. And, you know, we'll probably see him and Luke Mann switch off between leadoff or second. So I'm hoping that'll also give them some extra confidence heading in A&M. What's Ross Lovich's status? The last time I asked Beiser about it, it seems like it could be a bit. That Lovich wants to get back out there and play, but it's it, they don't want to rush it. He's not fully ready, but I'm hoping that it'll be soon. I mean, they need him. He's, he's a great power offensively, and he drives and runs, and they're definitely missing him out there, but I, you don't want to rush him back and make everything worse. So hopefully soon, but I don't even think Beiser has a strict timeline of when he'll be back yet. Well, it feels like their bats. I think they're last in the league and in, in runs scored in, in league play. Some of that may be due to schedule, but I watched him. Luke Mann had an exceptional weekend last week against Fandy. Wilmsmeyer hits his first two home runs. Dalton Bargo, Trevor Austin, Henry Zeisler have given them big things. I feel like they've got enough dudes to where they can take a series from most anybody. You look, you know, Dylan Leach can probably hit better than he's hit. Carlos Payne can certainly hit better than he's hit. I feel like there's a little bit of upside mm -hmm. for this lineup to tap into, especially against an A&M staff that we'll get into in a minute that is really, really struggling. And I agree. I think earlier in the year when they were playing those teams that weren't in the SEC, they were showing off their bats and getting into the double digits. And they said, I can't remember – 
how many runs they got, but they set a record earlier in the year from like most runs scored in a game for a couple of years. Um, so there is that they've got Luke Mann who's hit, I want to say he's now like fifth for most home runs all time at Mizzou. So they're, they've got that camp chick hits Dalton Bargo has got a, him and man lead most hits on the team when in conference play and then adding Wilms Meyer and Trevor Austin on top of that's a big help. The one thing that I've consistently noticed is they're at the beginning of the lineup. So they're getting on base, but then the struggle is driving them home. They've had a ton of games where they're left at second and third and in scoring position. And those runs come back to bite them at the end because have they gotten those guys all around all the bags? I mean, I think they could have taken a couple of SEC games, but they fell. I mean, they got swept by South Carolina and Kentucky and left a ton of runners in scoring position. And you kind of saw the same thing against Vanderbilt, not as extreme, but it's just an issue that's plagued them. I want to talk about Missouri away from home. Now, again, saw them in Arlington, one, but they wouldn't, I think, what, two of the three there played, played really well. Uh, the, the road has been a different story. I'm trying to look up the series they've had. Uh, they were what five and seven. They lost. They got swept at South Carolina. They got swept at Kentucky. And and maybe your answer is is in the that part because Kentucky and Carolina, two of the top five teams in the league in my mind at this point. Uh, do do you, what do you see different between them home and road? I know the it's a pitcher's park there at, at Taylor. Maybe that I don't know if they it plays to their style of play a little better or what it is or maybe maybe it's just as simple as. Let's look at who they played, but what do you think when you see the difference between how they play at home and how they play on the road? I think what helps at home is that level of confidence because, I mean, take, for example, they were able to sweep Tennessee at home, and Tennessee, I would say, is just as good of a club as Kentucky could be, especially at the beginning of the season. So, I mean, there's definitely a confidence factor, but as you mentioned, it is more of a pitcher's park, which I think benefits Missouri greatly because their pitching staff at the beginning of the year, I mean – now they've kind of struggled with injuries and whatnot. But at the beginning of the year, their pitching staff was very strong. They were getting the double digits for strikeouts every game at home. And you didn't really see that all the time with Kentucky and South Carolina when they were there. And so I think that that bothered their pitching staff. They weren't used to that exactly. But I'd like to see them turn it around at A&M and grab a couple away games. But I, I do think that they play better baseball when they're at home. Yeah, and the Aggies, if this is correct, are 14 and 8 at home, which is a little surprising given that's a team that was in Omaha a year ago. But um, this is a team that's that's really struggled to pitch. Um, I'm going to pull up some things here. Chris Cortez, I don't think, has been the, the guy that they thought he would be. Uh, it it feels like everybody's been erratic. They got one guy they can count on out of the bullpen right now. Uh, it feels like to me, I know they've got other talented guys, but the only guy that I really trust right now is Evan Ashenbeck. Detmer has not been very good. He's got a 5.98 ERA overall. Yeah. Uh, Justin Lampkin's been awful in league play. Detmer's got a 9.14 in the SEC. Lampkin's got an 11.17. Hard to win SEC games when you got starting pitchers with those ERAs in, in league competition. And that's what I had actually written down in my notes was those higher ERAs in conference because when you look at their stats generally, they're actually ranked 15th nationally in strikeouts with a rate of like 10.7 strikeouts per nine innings and Mizzou's right behind them at 16 with 10.7. So they're both heavy strikeout teams and they love to take their walks as well. Um, so I think that if they can really get to the A&M pitchers right away, and A&M likes to cycle through – they're, they go through a lot of pitchers per game. If you look at their midweek game, uh, they went through about seven pitchers. So I think if Missouri can attack right away and get through that, especially as you said, their bullpen hasn't been as strong and none of their starters have really kind of turned into what they needed them to be, that would be a good thing. Because um, when you look at their stats otherwise, as I said, they're, they're a high strikeout team, which is exactly what Missouri does. Yeah, here's some numbers on the Aggies in, in league play. AM has given up 82 runs. Let's see. I'm looking at the hitting. It would help if I look at the pitching. Let's do that. AM has scored 82 runs, I think. AM has given up 99, which is a lot. Um, free pass rate is 16.2%. That's the worst in the league tied with Florida and league games. No, I'm sorry. There's a couple teams worse than them, Georgia and Auburn, but it's one of the <laughs> worst. Uh, strikeout rate 
point nine percent. That's that's about league average. Um, they're it's really hard. They're not giving up a ton of home runs. In fact, I think they are the second best staff in the league at giving up home runs as a percentage of, of plate appearances. But it's it's base runners, and I, I think I'm looking at it now. The defense is not doing a really good job of turning balls in play into outs. We've got a 194 base runners per innings pitched, a 376 batting average on balls in play, which is second worst to Auburn. I think if you're Missouri, you just kind of hope to hit the ball hard. You hit line drives and, and hope they find some grass. And certainly we've seen this team do that a number of times. And that's exactly what I'm hoping for for them, especially, I mean, if you can just hit single after single, those will turn into runs that are really hard to stop, especially when the defensive production isn't at its best. I mean, when, as I said earlier, with Mann and Bargo and Wilmsmeyer, and especially with Chick back, they're big hit producers, especially Mann and Zeisler too, normally get a couple doubles every now and then. So if they can produce those and avoid the strikeouts, I think that would put them above a and this weekend, especially if Missouri can, provide a strong pitching staff as well. Now, the challenge is that hitting, and it's been uneven this year, but this is the team that slugged its way to Omaha a year ago, and most of those guys are back, or maybe not most, but a lot of them. Um, Brett Minich has been really good in limited time. I think he's healthy again, or last I checked, he was. He's been their top hitter so far when he's played, but he's missed most of the time with an injury that he suffered, I think, on opening day. Jack Moss, another guy who hit well for them last year that's hitting well this year. Hunter Haas, one of the top newcomers in the league. Jace Lavalette, another one of the top freshmen in the league. You look down the lineup, Trevor Warner is a guy who's one of their better players. I think he's been banged up a little bit, but he's capable of carrying a team in a weekend. Ryan Targach, who I saw last year in person hit a ball that had to be close to 500 feet. Uh, huge power source for them at second base. Has not had the year. He's expected to have neither's Austin boast. This is a really, really, really dangerous Aggie lineup if that gets going the way it can. Yeah, and that's the thing, especially with Hunter Haas. How he leads the team with a uh, 371 batting average, and Jace Lavalette was just given freshman of the week for the SEC, which I think is why it was so important for Missouri to have a 10 1 win over Missouri State earlier this week. I think that'll give them a lot of confidence heading into the series, especially even grabbing one game out of the three against Vanderbilt will mean a lot to them to prove that they can beat SEC teams after losing seven straight. Cause I mean, that's never good to do. And when you drop seven straight in your own conference, you lose a ton of confidence and it's hard to then go away from home and have to be a and M. So I think that those two out of the four games, taking those and having a stronger pitching staff than there was against um, South Carolina and Kentucky will help. But, I mean, if the pitching shows up, I really think that Missouri can take these games. Just, unfortunately, it's more of a what if as to what their pitching staff does this weekend. We spent a lot of time on Missouri, so I want to make sure we, we hit A&M, too. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and I, I said the thing about a lot of the the bats sort of underachieving compared to what we've seen for A&M before. It's the same thing with the arms. Nathan Detmer has been really, really good at times. He's better than a guy with a 914 ERA in the league. Um, Troy Wansing's a guy who can can help them, just it hasn't panned out so far this year. Same with Cortez. Cortez pitched pretty well last year in Omaha. Uh, Brad Rudis has, has pitched some innings for this team and, and, and been fairly good at times and been one of their better arms this year. Again, you got Evan Ashenbeck, who's a guy that I think's got a kind of a slower breaking ball as a Juco kid, throws a lot of strikes. He's been their best arm, and he's been that kind of guy like, Rory, if we're in a game and it's it's the sixth inning and it's tied at four and he's not been used yet, that's the guy in him I think brings in and, and might go the rest of the way. I mean, looking at their their pitchers, and their starters are strong when you look at the fact that Detmer – lead the team with like 45 strikeouts but it it's just a little concerning when you look at their overall stats and all their starters ERAs are pretty much over five which isn't something you want to see so that's just kind of the main concern I have with A&M's pitching staff but I mean when they're good they're good any parting thoughts on the series Rory I think just if Missouri can 
grab those singles and not leave. I mean, as basic as it sounds, not leave runners in scoring position. I really do think they can take this series. I, I think that their bats are starting to heat up again. I think Carlos Pena hitting that walk-off single is going to help him because he's been struggling as of late, hasn't played a ton, but is now back in the lineup. So I think that helps him at the end of the lineup with um, uh, Cologne as well, hitting normally out of the nine spot. So if the two of them can – driving those runs and pitching shows up with Murphy and Maltrude and all of them. I think this is a series that Mizzou can take. Yeah. And, and of note, both these teams have played brutal SEC schedules. Missouri's faced Tennessee and Vandy at home, Carolina, Kentucky on the road. A&M has faced LSU and college station road trip to Knoxville where it got swept, took two from Ole Miss uh, and then two at Auburn last weekend. So, and boy, it doesn't get easier for, for A&M. It's got, Road trip to Lexington next weekend, road trip to Fayetteville the weekend after that, then hosting Florida, Alabama, and then it eases up a little bit with a road trip to start for like, I guess. Um, but anyway, that's that is life in the SEC. <laughs> yeah, tough schedule they've had, seriously. Yeah. Well, looking forward to hearing from you next week, hopefully. Um, Missouri will have Alabama next weekend, which I think should be a pretty evenly matched series with two teams I think are a little bit better than, than maybe perception is. And uh, look forward to having you all men next week. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. All right. She's Rory Whetstone. She's part of our team coming to us live from the University of Missouri. Well, not live as you see it. Uh, and I'm Chris Lee of Southeast <laughs> Football Team presented – by Bearded Iris. Thank you for watching. If you hit the subscribe button and like button, that helps our analytics. We're doing SEC baseball content just about every day, so we hope you'll you'll watch and like it. Anyway, thank you for watching today. We'll see you again soon at Southeastern 14.